Today we will cover the second trait of the individual inshallah ta'ala and that is the trait of Iman, the trait of Iman. Now the word Iman cannot be translated in any single term in the English language, it cannot be translated very easily and we'll see why as we explore the topic today inshallah ta'ala that it has many connotations, it has many layers, it has some pillars to it as well and it is not a word that oftentimes you will find a, a close translation for. Sometimes you will see the word faith, other times beliefs. And there is a little bit of both, of course, but it's much more than that. I'll start with something light. I'll start with a joke, just so we can start off light, inshallah ta'ala. We don't usually start with jokes, but episode two, inshallah ta'ala, will start with a joke. And some of you have heard this joke before. At one time, a young man, he calls a sheikh, and he says, I'm struggling. I have this temptation. I'm struggling with this problem struggling with my faith. He says, what's going on? He says, I feel like I'm constantly thinking about this girl and I can't get her out of my mind. So the sheikh tells him, make dua. He's like, okay, I'll make dua. He says, what kind of dua should I make? He's like, there's so many dua from the Quran that will help you purify your heart and ask Allah to protect you from anything evil and ask Allah to fill your heart with faith. So he says, give me an example of a, a dua from the Quran. So he references an ayah that we will cover today, inshallah. Allah mahabib ilayya al iman wa zayyinhu fi qalbi. O oh Allah, make iman, faith, belief, beloved to me, and decorate my heart with it. And as he continues, he's trying to explain the dua, the young man interrupts. He says, Ya Shaykh, her name is Iman. You're telling me to make dua. Of course, this is a joke, so nobody take it seriously, inshallah. Our ummah cannot have success if there are no believers. There is no ummah without iman. There is no ummah without iman. And Iman is, yes, an individual experience, but your Iman has ripple effects on all of society. And your Iman has ripple effects on the future of mankind as well. The level of your Iman and the consistency of that level as well has an impact on your family, on your workplace, your education, the people you interact with in society. The Iman of a believer could be the reason that many people in this country have converted to Islam or heard about Islam. Your Iman could be the reason that you're elevated to high ranks in paradise. So let us start with first talking about the blessings of Iman. There's a lot of good news, a lot of glad tidings. If I were to ask, what are some of the blessings of Iman that you know of from the Quran or Sunnah? There are so many examples. We'll mention seven or eight, inshallah. The first, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us about, uh, and we hear this in the seerah and we study this as well, the Bedouins who come to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and they are boasting that they've accepted Islam. They are bragging about it, and you know this from Surah Al-Hujurat, يَمُنُّونَ عَلَيْكَ أَنْ أَسْلَمُوا They are uh, regarding their acceptance of Islam as a favor to you. Like they think, hey, I became Muslim, so you should appreciate what I'm doing. Like it's a favor to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. قُلْ لَا تَمُنُّ عَلَيَّ إِسْلَامَكُمْ بَلِ اللَّهُ يَمُنُّ عَلَيْكُمْ أَنْ هَدَاكُمْ لِلْإِيمَانِ إِنْ كُنْتُمْ صَادِقِينَ Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Taala commands the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Tell those individuals who said that, tell those Bedouins, O Prophet, tell them, do not regard your Islam as a favor to me, rather it is Allah who has done you a favor by guiding you to Iman. It is Allah who gave you this blessing by guiding you to Iman, indeed if you are faithful. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala shows them and shows us multiple favors and amongst them is the favor of Iman. So first and foremost, we find this reference in the Quran, it was very interesting uh, wording. أُولَٰئِكَ uh, كَتَبَ فِي قُلُوبِهِمُ الْإِيمَانِ That Allah has written Iman in their hearts. وَأَيَّدَهُمْ بِرُوحٍ مِّنْ And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala aided them بِرُوحٍ مِّنْ Meaning a type of spirit from Him. So in other words, the Iman that you have in your heart, your spiritual heart, your ruh or your qalb, sometimes they are interchangeable. This is from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And someone may ask, well, what about those who don't have it written in their hearts? Is that fair? No, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala saw something sincere in your heart and in your actions. So He blessed you with Iman, that you are able to embrace it. The second blessing of Iman is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala makes Iman beloved to those whom He loves and because He sees something good in them. And then He beautifies them with it. And that goes back to the ayah that we just referenced in the story. وَلَكِنَّ اللَّهَ حَبَّبَ إِلَيْكُمُ الْإِيمَانِ Allah had made Iman beloved to you. وَزَيَّنَهُ فِي قُلُوبِكُمْ And He decorated your hearts with it. So your heart becomes beautiful with Iman. So the beauty of the heart is proportionate to how much Iman you have. And then, وَكَرَّهَ إِلَيْكُمُ الْكُفْرَ وَالْفُسُوقَ وَالْعِصْيَانِ أُولَٰئِكَ هُمْ الرَّاشِدُونَ This is part of that dua that we sometimes make. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made, hated to you, disbelief in Allah 
and uh, mischief and immorality. And this is a blessing from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The third blessing, very quickly, of Iman is that it has a type of taste. An example that we always have in, in the Arabic language is, is when you say the sweetness of something. Halawat al-Iman. So when you talk about sweetness, the example obviously that we can give, if you're really hungry or you're fasting, and then the very first thing you eat is that date, and it's sweet, yes, and some people, maybe they'll say, I don't like dates, but the very first thing you eat and the sweetness that it has, generally sweet things are beloved to people in terms of food. Generally, when you have a really good fruit, it's considered you know, something amazing. It's a great experience physically. And uh, I'll give you an example. Just a few weeks ago, a friend sent me uh, just like this small box of uh, tropical fruits from Trinidad. And he's like, I think you like these. I know you've traveled there before, but you didn't, perhaps you didn't try these. And I tried them. They were amazing. Uh, in Arabic, we call them ishtla. In English, they have multiple, uh, they have, uh, multiple types uh, in terms of their, the, the fruit itself. And it's very, very sweet. It's very sweet. It's not ishtal like the dairy you guys are thinking of. It's the ishtal that you guys know of. So when I tasted it, I thought, subhanAllah, every time we find a new fruit from a different country and we, we eat it and we're like, this is so amazing. And we find that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala references the fruits of Jannah especially. And when we talk about these fruits, they're not cut off, eternal supply, as much as you want. And the only similarity between the fruit of Jannah and the fruit you have here is the word itself, but rather the experience, the quality, the quantity is very different. So sweet things, we understand this experience at the physical level. But what about the spiritual level? Think of a time in your life in which you felt like you were really, really content or enjoying an act of worship or connected to Allah more than perhaps the day before or the week before or the minute before. Maybe you were making dua, maybe you went for Umrah, maybe you went for Hajj, maybe it was the first time you experienced something new. And you made dua to Allah, you were connected to Allah, you tasted the sweetness of Iman. Or you put your trust in Allah, and or you saw a dua being accepted in a specific way. You tasted the sweetness of faith. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, al-Iman. He has tasted the sweetness of faith. Man radiya billahi rabba, the one who is pleased, content with Allah as his Lord, wa bil Islam dina and Islam as his religion, wa bi Muhammadin Rasula sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and with Prophet Muhammad as his messenger. And this is similar to the dua we are supposed to make as part of Athkaru sabahi wal masa, raditu billahi rabba wa bil Islam dina wa bi Muhammadin sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, nabiyan wa rasula. There's a sweetness of faith that you experience when you're content with Islam. Someone may be intellectually convinced Islam is true, and they do all the acts of worship, they stay away from all the prohibitions, but they feel like they do not like acts of worship and they do not like staying away from the prohibitions, not in the sense of desires, but internally, spiritually, psychologically, they feel like they hate it. And I've had people, for example, in many classes, they'll say, listen, I know Islam is true. I will never leave Islam, inshallah ta'ala, but I feel like I hate to do these acts of worship. Why? Why am I like that? How can I overcome that? And so oftentimes in these conversations, we'll talk about the sweetness of faith that you can experience when your Iman starts to increase. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us that. Number four of the blessings of Iman, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives us an analogy, a parable. It's like the example of a beautiful and strong and blessed tree. And the example is in Surah Ibrahim, uh, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives us the example of kalimatin tayyiba, and He gives us the opposite example as well. But kalimatin tayyiba is the shahada. It is your Iman, it is your faith. Kashajaratin tayyiba. It is like a good tree. Tayyiba is not just good. Tayyiba is pure. Tayyiba is blessed. Asluha thabit. It is, its uh, roots are very firm. Wa far'uha fi sama. Its branches are out. There's an entire lecture we can give just on the parable in Surah Ibrahim. La ilaha illallah being like this tree. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives us the example of Iman. The stronger your Iman, the more rooted your Iman in terms of your foundation, your connection to Allah spiritually, intellectually, the more beneficial you are, and also your branches are out. What does this mean? You are benefiting society, your family, other people. You cannot revive the ummah without iman. You cannot possibly look at a pathway where someone says, listen, we can revive the ummah. The only thing we need is social justice. The only thing we need is one good leader, one good ruler. You need iman. Whether in that ruler or in that system or in that educational program or in that curriculum or in that movement or in social justice, you can't have any of this without Iman included in it. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us that. Number five of eight. Iman, as we said, has a type of sweetness to the extent that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said, whoever has three traits, three characteristics within himself will find the sweetness of faith. 
And this, these mean three amongst many others. The first, the one who loves Allah and his messenger more than anyone else. More than, rather, I should say anything else. The second is the one who loves a servant, another person, their friend, for example, only for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And one who hates to turn back to kufr, to disbelief after Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala saved him, just as much as he hates to be thrown into the fire. The example of this, I believe I, I mentioned this last week, or maybe in one of the Friday khutbas, is the man who had converted to Islam, and he used to have a lifestyle that sometimes people think is what they want. He said he was a, a rapper, small time rapper, and he, he dealt drugs, and he was drinking alcohol, he would club on the weekends, he was doing a lot of the things that people think uh, is amazing or is fulfilling. He said, I felt empty. Anyways, long story short, he converted to Islam. He said, if somebody offered me a billion dollars, he's like, and of course, I mean more than that as well, I would never go back to what I used to do before. I would never go back to that lifestyle. Why? He said, now I feel like I'm really living life. This is the real life. And of course, we know he means by this, this is why I was created. Now I feel alive. There's real meaning that's attached to my actions and it's not arbitrary. It's not uh, constructed by society. It's not a social construct. So oftentimes when a nihilist, a meaningless lifestyle, when somebody says there's no purpose to life and they don't believe in an afterlife and they reject belief in God and they claim you have to come up with your own meaning, oftentimes they will realize as they're coming up with their own meaning that it, it's a paradox. You are contradicting your claim that life is meaningless and you are trying to come up with your own meaning for it. It's subjective. It will change. So you're giving yourself meaning because you've removed the actual meaning that came with it, the purpose of life, to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So this man, he says to these young youth in, in this program, he says, you guys have no idea. Like you guys think it's cool to do those things, but I, I used to live that lifestyle. I wasn't happy inside. And I'm blessed with Islam. I'm blessed with what I have now. And I, if you offered me anything of this world, if you offered me a billion dollars, literally, I would not go back to that lifestyle. Number six, Iman has a light that fills the heart, nur. Now the concept of nur is mentioned in the Quran in many different forms. But amongst them, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us, not just Allahu nuru samawati wal ard, in surah al-nur, ayat al-nur as well, the verse of the light as it's called. One of the verses, by the way, that has so much commentary in the books of tafsir. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala also talks about the one who walks with a light in this world. So you have in Surah Al-Hadid this example, Ya ayyuhal ladheena amnu, O you who believe, ittaqu Allah wa aminu bi rasulihi, believe in Allah and follow the messenger, or be conscious of Allah and follow the messenger, yu'tikum kiflayni min rahmatihi, will give you double share of his mercy, there's a meaning to this, wa yaj'al lakum nuran tamshuna bihi, and he will give you a nur to walk with, bihi, not fihi. So when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says نُورًا تَمْشُونَ بِهِ وَيَغْفِرُ لَكُمُ اللَّهُ غَفُورُ الرَّحِيمُ It means that if you believe in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and you follow the Messenger alayhi salatu wa salam so you have taqwa in your life it means that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not just going to give you a light that is there when you're connected let's say in one moment to one situation, one environment so it has conditions rather تَمْشُونَ بِهِ you're walking with light when you're walking with light, it means that as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala blessed you with Iman and you're doing the right things and you believe in Allah, you are a source of light for others. You are a source of light through your character, you're a source of light in terms of your education, you're a source of light in terms of your workplace, it's not limited. And here's the beautiful part, the light of this world, that nur that Allah mentions is linked to the nur of the akhirah. So on the day of judgment, a lot of people may not know this, but the sirat, the bridge over the hellfire, when people, all of humanity has to cross Everyone has to cross. Initially, there is no light. Initially, it is pitch black darkness. So everyone who's about to cross, so it's the Muslims, the believers, and it is the munafiqeen, the hypocrites. The rest did not make it. The hypocrites are here for a reason. Because they fake their Islam in this world. They're about to cross now. And as they are about to cross, this light is given to them. And as you know from Surah Al-Hadid and uh, Surah Al-Tahreem, that light is extinguished for the munafiqin. They are not able to see anymore. Why? They faked their light in this world, and so they were given a deceptive light in the next life, and in fact, they were living upon darkness, but the believers are able to see. They are able to see in proportion to the nur that they had in this world. The light with which you walk in this world, in terms of your connection to Allah, your connection to an-nur, the revelation itself, as is one of its nicknames, will give you more light as you're crossing over the hellfire. So you're able to see by the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and this is uh, a blessing from Allah. Number seven, Iman is mentioned in the hadith as conquering and not being conquered. The stronger your Iman, the less afraid you are of worldly things and people. 
The stronger your Iman, the less afraid you are of the enemies of Islam. The stronger your Iman, the more likely you are to be courageous and brave. Even if there is sometimes nervousness, even if there is sometimes wonder, how will I succeed? Where is the victory com going to come from? Sahaba may have wondered, some of them, at times. And they were constantly reminded, constantly reminded. And the Prophet ﷺ told us, Iman conquers everything else. It is not conquered, meaning nothing can conquer it. This comes with a strong Iman. And finally, number eight. Iman, which deserves its own, again, one, two, three topics, uh, its own series, has many levels and it has many branches. Has many levels and it has many branches. The Prophet ﷺ tells us that it's composed of 60 odd branches. In other words, there are many different levels and branches and facets to Iman. Amongst them, the highest and most important is what? What is the most important aspect of Iman? The branches. La ilaha illallah. From the authentic hadith, it is La ilaha illallah. So the shahada is the best facet of Iman, it is the foundation. And the lowest part is imatatul adha an al tariq to remove something harmful from the path. This is the lowest level of iman. And one time, by the way, one of my friends was sharing. He was driving with one of our teachers, and he was making dhikr, du'a, subhanallah, alhamdulillah, la ilaha illallah akbar. And at one point, he was just repeating the shahada over and over and over, just a form of dhikr, la ilaha illallah, la ilaha illallah. And then they, they got to an area where there was a branch on the side of the street. It's a residential area. It's not even in the middle of the road. But he said, can you just you know pull over? He pulls over and the shaykh gets out and he's still saying la ilaha illallah and he removes this branch. And my friend when he shared this I said it's very amazing subhanAllah. He's making dhikr with the highest branch of iman and he sees something on the street with the lowest branch the least meaning you can do. is to remove something harmful from the path. Sometimes we don't think twice. We see things and assume somebody else will remove it. But this is the lowest degree of faith. Why? It is a way to protect other people. A way to serve humanity. And it's a reminder for us about the different facets of iman. One of the signs of iman is that you want to study Iman, that you want to know more about it, that you want to explore the branches of Iman, that you want to be reminded of it, that you don't think, for example, well, I've heard about Iman for 50 years of my life or 10 years of my life, or I took an entire Islamic studies class about Iman, I don't need to learn more. The Sahaba always felt like they needed to renew their Iman. Jaddidu Imanakum, the Prophet says, renew your Iman. How do we do that, Ya Rasulullah? Kayfa nujaddidu Imanana? He said, Akthiru min qawli la ilaha illallah. Repeat, la ilaha illallah, meaning just increase in that. And the Sahaba at times would also say things like, let's meet together, let's go congregate, let's go to the masjid, uh, min sa'a, to believe for an hour. Does this mean we're only going to believe for an hour? No, it means to be reminded of Allah and to increase our iman for a moment. And the way to do this is through remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Going all the way back to the time of the Sahaba and the Tabi'een, we find something interesting in our history, in our theological history, that the first theological uh, controversy was over, uh, controversy is, is a subjective term, controversy or dispute among some people was how do you define Iman and who is a mu'min? And I know this is not something for us to worry about in our times, alhamdulillah, but who is a mu'min and how do you define things? It takes us to a small and, and towards a small tangent very quickly. How do we define things? For example, when it comes to scriptural evidence, you know what salah is based on the Quran and Sunnah. You don't, you don't define salah based on its literal uh, linguistic definition. You have the linguistic and the shari definition for different terms. Otherwise, we would say salah is just a uh, type of dua, sila, a connection. The second is through a linguistic evidence. So it's not from the Quran or Sunnah, but it's based on uh, pre-Islamic poetry. It's based on the, the commentary of the people of that time, how they spoke. So you look at the language of the people and you'll contextualize the scholars. will contextualize what this word meant at that time. So, uh, for example, they used to refer to إِلَى الْكَعْبَيْنِ in the ayah of Surah Al-Ma'idah and as you're making wudu, what does this mean? إِلَى الْكَعْبَيْنِ And also when you talk about wudu up to the elbows, including the elbow, when you talk about your feet, how do you wash, do you uh, wipe? So all of this is included in some of the language of the people. And the third, sometimes, is through the cultural norms as well. So a lot of scholars will say the word safar. It's mentioned in the Quran. You have many ahadith about who is a musafir. How far do you have to go to be a traveler? Somebody reaches out and says, I work an hour away, which is very common in the US. I work over, let's say, 70 miles away. And I come back home every single day, but that's my work. Am I allowed to, am I considered a musafir when I go to work so I can do qasr for the rest of the time I have this job? And so the reality is you, you look at, and many scholars rather, they looked at the cultural understanding of safar and not only what some scholars have said, which is a valid opinion, that it's based on a fixed uh, distance. Otherwise, in some context, you'll have somebody who's not really a musafir, 
and, and they're taking advantage of something that they are not supposed to be taking advantage of, and the opposite, somebody who's actually traveling, but it's, let's say, close by, they're not considered musafir based on the uh, madhab that they are following. So the scholars will look at different contexts and extract from them the principles, the maxims that we need based on, of course, uh, a certain methodology, a certain uh, set of principles, and they will follow this in terms of their rulings. The word iman has two main meanings. The word iman, number one, uh, comes from or means to protect, to secure, amina. And what it means is basically to grant protection to or to grant security to. This is pretty straightforward. The second is to believe. And the proof of this is in the Quran, one of the many proofs, to believe someone. So I believe what you said to me, this is a type of iman. What does that mean? What is the example? Who can tell us the proof from the Quran? Surah Yusuf. Before that one. La ta'manna ala Yusuf. This is good. There's one before it. So you find, or sorry, a different one. I shouldn't say before it. You are not going to believe us. Mu'min here is not a believer. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala here, you're not going to be a believer in us, in what we are saying to you. Wama anta bi mu'min illana wa la kunna So you're not going to believe us. In other words, to believe and a type of security, to envelop someone with protection. And so the scholars of the past, there was a dispute, yes. The scholars of the past, we find over maybe 500, 600 statements from the Sahaba, from the Tabi'een, the next generation, from the generation after that, the best three of generations. And you compile all of these narrations, all the statements, all the elements of the definition, and you find it summarized as Iman is comprised of statements and of actions, some will say it is internal and it is external. Iman is something that increases and decreases. These are all different components uh, that they use. Al-Hasan al-Basri, rahimahullah, he said, he said, Iman is not to decorate oneself, externally meaning. It's not to show off. Rather, it is not false hope. It is what settles in the heart and it is confirmed with your actions. So you have multiple elements to the concept of Iman. And you have the famous statement of Abdullah bin Umar, radiallahu anhu. Actually, this is a very important one as, a, as an evidence. He says, we learned Iman, and then we learned the Qur'an and it increased us in Iman. So you have from this some components of what Iman means. So when we talk about Iman, at the end of the day, we say this is the comprehensive definition. Iman is a belief in the heart, and it is statements on the tongue, and it is confirmed by your actions, actions of the limbs, and it increases and decreases. This is what Iman is according to Ahlul Sunnah. Obviously, you have other groups that have different definitions and this is beyond uh, the realm of our discussion today. Iman is based on what? If somebody were to ask you, how do you have faith? You just, you're a blind follower? Is that what Iman is? It's like blind faith? This is why we said you can't translate Iman as faith. It's a very weak translation because usually, especially in the US, uh, in most Western countries, if you say faith, it has multiple definitions and connotations, but amongst them, they mean faith in something you don't have uh, an evidence for. Sometimes it means, I have faith in you. I mean, there's no evidence, but I have faith you'll get it done. It's a type of hope sometimes. Faith here, and sometimes faith means like religion, your faith tradition. Faith here, in terms of Iman, we should say, is based on the fitrah first, the natural disposition. The natural disposition means uh, we have a type of knowledge, a type of... Uh, knowledge that we are born with and develops as we mature, as we grow. Uh, and there, there are a lot of actually psychologists who hold this opinion. Amongst them is Dr. Justin Barrett. He's a famous psychologist and he studies psychology of religion and anthropology and evolutionary psychology. He's a Christian, but he has an entire book on this topic for those interested in this field. It's called Born Believers. And he talks about how the natural religion, the natural beliefs of human beings as children if you don't corrupt them, if you don't change them, if you don't secularize them, if you will, is to believe in a higher power, is to believe that the soul moves on. The soul, meaning the person who died physically, their body died, but the person is still alive somewhere. This is the natural faith. This is the fitrah, of course, for us. The second is evidence that the Qur'an is from Allah. Iman is based on something very tangible, empirical. You can study it. The Qur'an and its ijaz. The third is evidence that the Prophet ﷺ is a true prophet. The fourth is the signs of Allah around us today. And as we advance in science and technology, it should bring us even closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The fifth is experiences that we have. Most times when we ask someone, why do you believe in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? It's not based on an intellectual evidence that they're going to use to convince someone else. Rather, they know from experience. I experienced something, they'll say. I know, I felt things over my, the, the duration of my life. And finally, Trust in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the search for higher meaning and purpose. 
Iman has many pillars, and I'm not referring to the six pillars of Iman uh, that are mentioned in the famous hadith, to believe in Allah and the angels and the kutub, the scriptures and the messengers. Rather, there are pillars that we just mentioned, which is in the heart, uh, on the tongue, and in your uh, actions. These are three things we need to actually talk about as a foundation. Why? Because if we don't focus on these three in terms of revival, for us as individuals, we will be missing some potential. So as for the first, belief in the heart. So this is knowledge, affirmation, that I believe in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The Bedouins that we mentioned at the very beginning of the, the session, قالت الأعراب آمنا. The Bedouins came and they said, we believe, we have Iman. قل لم تؤمنوا ولكن قولوا أسلمنا. Do not say that you are believers with Iman, rather say we've submitted, we've become Muslim. ولما يدخل الإيمان في قلوبكم until basically uh, Iman actually, faith actually enters your heart. Until your belief in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala settles in the heart. So there's an action of the heart that takes place. There is a relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that starts internally before anything external happens. And there are no scholars who deny the reality that if someone is being tortured, like Ammar bin Yasir radiallahu anhumah, and he says something external that he does not mean. Internally, he says to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa that he still believes and he's very sad and scared and upset. That he, he said something that they wanted him to say as he's being tortured, that he's not a Muslim, he's a disbeliever. But he doesn't believe what he's saying on the tongue. He said this just so he won't be tortured. And he's reminded actually in a verse, not just hadith, he's reminded in a verse in Surah Al-Nah that this is not considered kufr. Because he's being tortured in the moment, it's beyond the, the, the realm of his capacity. He's not held accountable for it. So no one denied this amongst the scholars or movements in the history of Islam that this person actually is a believer in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The second, when we talk about the actions of the heart, أعمال القلوب or عمل القلب uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says والذين آمنوا أشد حبا لله Those who believe and may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us amongst them have a, an intense love for Allah they are more loving of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala this is referring to uh, comparison to others so when you love Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala you experience certain types of psychological spiritual emotions and this is a really crucial point here because many times people will ask what is the relationship between the emotions and the internal thoughts that we have with our Iman. What are some examples? An example, we obviously beyond the, the scope of our talk today, an example of like tawakkul, to trust in Allah. Where does that come from? Or your hope in Allah's mercy, that you never lose hope, that Allah will forgive you if you keep repenting sincerely. You can't lose that hope, because Allah told you not to lose that hope. But also there's fear, there's khashya. That, that khashya has, has to also have a certain uh, quantity and a certain quality to it. That you don't want to have shortcomings. You don't want to violate the laws of Allah. You don't want to be uh, considered uh, somebody who's committing that uh, spiritual crime or religious crime. So there are a range of emotions. You're afraid to meet Allah and you're not prepared. There's also the emotion of, uh, a type of emotion, which say, there's the, the experience of gratitude to Allah. There's the experience of optimism with Allah. At-tafa'ul, min al-iman, that you're thinking good of Allah. husn al-dhan billah. This is all a part of Iman, and there's an overlap between the psycho-spiritual as well. But at the end of the day, when you hear people making fun of God, insulting Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, insulting the Prophet wasallam, the feeling you have internally that something is wrong, that you're, you're upset about it, that's a good sign. Meaning what? This is a sign that there's Iman. That you're, you're, you're frustrated that people are insulting the Creator. How can you insult the one who created you? How can you, how can you be, as a Muslim, okay, not, you don't feel anything at all, when you see somebody drawing, for example, the Prophet ﷺ, obviously it's not him, trying to depict him and mock him and insult him. You know it's not him, ﷺ. But the Muslim naturally will feel something. Like, oh, what are you doing mocking the final messenger of, of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who came to save you from the hellfire, came to give you mercy, came to give you salvation. How can you mock the very person who is trying to benefit you in this life and the next? So when you hear people making fun of religion or Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, of course, I'm not talking about your physical reaction here. I'm just talking about the internal state. What happens? That feeling like something is wrong, that's a sign of iman. That's a type of emotion that we are talking about here. But again, there are many others. Amongst them is respect and haya, haya towards Allah. Haya, many times people will talk about it as with regards to clothing or your awra, like what's supposed to be covered. Or many times it's limited just the scope of hijab. Haya is much more than that. It includes that, but it's more than just your clothes. It's more than just what people can see. It's how you carry yourself your interaction with others. It's the way you talk. It's also the way you are in private between you and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That is haya. Meaning what? إِذَا لَمْ تَسْتَحِي If you have no haya before Allah, فَاصْنَعْ مَا شِئْتِ You're going to do, this is one meaning, you're going to do whatever you want. Because you're following your desires, not, not modesty towards Allah. Modesty towards Allah is that you are cautious. So the scholars of Ahlul Sunnah did not disagree for the most part until a certain point in history that iman increases and decreases. If you want, think of uh, maybe a knob that you turn. 
And if zero means no Iman, and let's say the maximum on the snob is 100, your Iman can go up and can go down. Iman can rise and can fall. And of course, there are many examples of this from the Quran we'll cover later, inshallah ta'ala. And then you have an example as well in the devil himself. And this is why we talk about the internal state before the external. We know the story of Adam alayhi salam and how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala commanded the devil to prostrate. This is when he was still a believer. And at this point, the devil, he's not amongst the malaika in terms of his being, his essence. He's not from the malaika. He's amongst the jinn, but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave him the ability, the blessing of being amongst the malaika because he worshipped. Now, here's a really crucial point. None of us saw what the devil saw. We weren't there to see rows and rows and rows of malaika. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us from any pride. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us from any kibir that can completely destroy a moment or cloud our judgment. Because in that moment, you knew, you saw Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You saw the malaika. The, the devil believes in Allah. Even the devil believes in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, which is why atheism is considered the lowest level of kufr. Even the devil believes in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But what did he do externally? Aba wastakbara wa kana minal kafirin. He rejected the command of Allah. He, his, his kibir, his pride, manifested externally now in action. And he's now classified amongst al kafirin. Sometimes Muslims say, oh, a kafir is someone who doesn't know the truth. No. Or a kafir is someone who uh, rejected belief in Allah. No. The devil believes in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He believes in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But rather, he rejected worship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Which is why it's so frightening for someone to not have seen Allah and to be arrogant. For someone to not see Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and to have kibir. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us. The second is the iman that shows up on the tongue. Why are we separating the tongue from the limbs? Because the scholars say there's so much emphasis in the Quran and the Sunnah of the Prophet والسلام, of emphasizing la ilaha illallah, dhikr, dua, all of this. This is a sign that you are a believer. Qulu amanna, say we believe in Allah. So these, these are examples from Surah Al-Baqarah and Al-Imran. These are examples of what's said on the tongue. And then the third is your actions. And this is where there's some dispute and there was dispute among some scholars historically. How much of your action is required to prove your iman, to confirm the iman that's in your heart? How much or how little in other words? And so the, the frightening thing is to think that if the devil rejected one sajda, one prostration, and this is considered a type of kibir, arrogance, that you disobeyed Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. What about the one who rejects 30 sajdas a day, meaning all of their prayers, as an example? So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, throughout the Qur'an, combines iman with amal salih. Alladheena amanu wa aminu salihat. Not once, not twice, but over 30 or 40 times. And maybe 50 or 60 different passages of the Qur'an. Your belief, your iman is always linked to your actions. Wa aminu salihat. So it's actions of the limbs, they are connected. And this is our human psychology. If you believe in something, your actions sometimes will reflect it. That you're going to do something, you're going to live by it in some way. If you have a strong belief, you're going to do a lot of actions. You're going to do a lot of different things. And it's unreasonable to assume that someone can say they are a mu'min, they have iman in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and never ever do a single act of worship. And I don't mean they're about to, like they just became Muslim. No, they don't intend to ever worship Allah. But they say, I believe in Allah. So the scholars say the manifestation of Iman, they might be Muslim, but the manifestation of Iman has to be in some action. Maybe you stayed away from something haram. Maybe you, you mentioned La ilaha illallah. So there's some false hope otherwise. And we always give this example of the university student. We have many students who just started their semesters. May Allah make it easy for you. An example is you start the semester and say, I will not follow any of the metrics of success according to the syllabus. I'm just gonna do what I want. I'm gonna skip every class, every assignment, and you have a 0% in this class and then you expect it 100%. Well, it's unreasonable to assume something other than the actual metrics that were given to you. So in other words, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reminds us, and this is also through the, uh, the, the hadith that we mentioned of the different branches of Iman, that la ilaha illallah is the highest branch, but the lowest branch is to move something harmful, meaning an action. To do something, to move, to do something with your limbs, it's the lowest type of Iman. Now, many times people will say, listen, but he has a good heart. She has a good heart. And this is a very common misunderstanding of faith. Sometimes it's taken from Christianity. Because in Christianity you will find there's an emphasis on the concept of grace. You know what? God has forgiven you already, so who cares what you do? That's not what they say, but that's what it entails. And that's why for many Christians, Christianity is a very symbolic, shell-like religion. There's a shell, but it's very hollow on the inside. And that's why many Christians are leaving Christianity. There isn't much emphasis on your actions. No, no, it's all the grace of God. We have a combination of 
mercy from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but also jaza'an bima kanu ya'malun, related to what you used to do. So you're looking for the mercy of Allah. This is like the example one time I walked into. Bismillah. You okay? No, it's okay. Yeah. Alhamdulillah. The example I walked into uh, in Dearborn, I walked into a store, uh, sorry, a restaurant to pick up some food for the family. It was a pickup order. And as I, I got there, I walked in, and of course this has to happen in Dearborn, Michigan. I walked in and they see me like, Sheikh, can you answer this question? There's an argument. And they don't know me, I don't know them. I don't know why they said Sheikh, maybe they saw a beard and you know, some people are like, oh, beard means Sheikh, okay. So they're like, we have an argument. Like the guy to register with the guy who's paying for his food. I said, I'm just here to pick up my food, like I gotta go. They're like, no, 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 please, very fast, very fast. I'm like, okay, as I'm paying, I'm like, it has to be fast. So what's the argument? The guy who's buying his food, he's saying, listen, I don't believe Salah is mandatory because I know a lot of people who pray and they have really bad character. And at the end of the day, all that really matters to Allah is what's in the hearts. Like if we have good hearts, there's Iman in the heart. Why does the Salah matter? I know some people who pray, they have the worst character. They're the worst people. And they're worse than some of the, 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 the non-Muslims that I know. And the other guy is saying, what? Well, no, but you need, like, you need to pray. It's mandatory. If you leave it, you could potentially be risking your, your Islam altogether. So I'm like, listen, it's summarized as follows. Do you believe that good character is mandatory? He says, yes. I mean, I'm like, I know. That's why you're arguing for it. It's, it's mandatory? Yes. Let's put it on the side for a moment. It's mandatory. That's the ruling on it. We know this. We have countless evidences that good character is a big part of Islam. It's one of the heaviest things on the scale on the Day of Judgment. Let's move over to a different topic. Salah. Is it mandatory? He says, oh, but I know people who pray. And I'm like, hold on, hold on. You keep going back to these bad people you know. You can't say, I know what's in people's hearts. You judge things based on the external as Allah gave us the judgments. Not for me to judge where you're ending up. No. The action itself is disobedience of Allah. A good thing or a bad thing. He says, I don't like to answer it that way. I say, you're trying to avoid the question. Because at the end of the day, you can't say someone has a good heart. You can't see in their hearts. You can assume good of people and you should. But if the external action is something Allah defined as evil, contradicts iman, then you cannot say this is a good action or a good lifestyle. So we don't judge things based on what people say. She's so kind, he's so kind. Kindness is in alignment with what Allah tells us is good. So you're right, that's a good thing. But for you to say he has a good heart, you don't know that. Sometimes you don't even know your own heart. How can you talk about the hearts of other people? So yes, Muslims with bad character do not represent the Islamic teachings. Even if they pray, they fast, they attend the masajid, even if they're men who are always in the masjid or women who wear the proper hijab, it doesn't matter. The, the bad character is its own discussion and it's a bad thing. That's not the role model of Islam. You look at the prayer, is it mandatory? Yes. Leaving prayer, is it a major, major, major sin? Yes. In fact, it's a very dangerous major sin. So it's, they're not mutually exclusive. In other words, don't talk about Iman as this symbolic idea. It's a very postmodernist discussion. It usually comes again from Christians and from societies that want to water down religion. You know, if someone's kind in character, that's enough to say what? He has a good heart. She has a good heart. That's all that Allah cares about. That's, a, that's not what Allah tells us. So where are you getting this from? In other words, you, you need to uh, include with this the actions of the limbs. Iman and Islam are sometimes uh, intertwined. And if someone were to ask you, what is the difference between Islam and Iman? You could think of maybe some ayat that mention both, like the one we just mentioned about the Bedouins, or you could think of the hadith of uh, Abu Huraira or Umar al-Khattab, the long hadith uh, in which Jibreel a.s. came and he asked and he came to teach, what is Islam, what is Iman, what is Ihsan, right? So the scholars say, and this is the, the, the strongest opinion, the scholars say there is a lot of evidence that when they are used together, they have di distinct meanings. When they are used in different contexts, they are interchangeable. So it depends on the context of the Qur'an or the Sunnah, but generally they are interchangeable. And then where's the dispute? Where's the dispute amongst the early generations? It's about whether or not Iman increases or decreases. There are some groups, in fact, who said that Iman does not uh, increase or decrease. It's on or off, binary, like zero or one. You either have Iman or you don't. And there are some Muslims today who follow this opinion. But the overwhelming majority of scholars, and actually we shouldn't say scholars, let's go back to the first generation. The overwhelming majority of the Sahaba, the Tabi'in, we have literally over 500 statements uh, to this effect, understood Iman as having multiple components, and many of them will specify with those components that it rises and falls. Are there some major scholars who didn't say that? Yes, there are. Imam Malik rahimullah said, Iman increases based on the Quran. Iman increases, so it's not static, on or off, it's not binary, I should say. But he said it doesn't decrease. 
the overwhelming majority of scholars that know increases and decreases and there are many examples from the Quran and from the Sunnah but let's start with a story the famous story of Abu Bakr radiallahu an, and the one who reports the hadith is no, none other than Hanbala radiallahu an. this is a famous hadith uh, reported in Sahih Muslim where basically he leaves his home and he runs into Abu Bakr radiallahu an, and as he runs into him he says Kayfa anta ya Hanbala how are you doing and he says nafaqa Hanbala about himself he says Hanbala has become a hypocrite so he says, what happened? What are you saying? Qala, subhanallah, ma taqul? What are you saying? So he says to him, to, to summarize, he says, when we are in the company of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, we reflect on hellfire and paradise as if we are seeing them with our own eyes. You know, in that time, that place where you're hearing maybe a lecture on Jannah in detail, you feel like you're seeing it. You feel like your iman is so strong. So he says, it's like we're seeing them with our own eyes. But when we are away from the Prophet والسلام, and we attend to our wives, our children, our business, our work, our family, in other words, most of these things pertaining to the Akhirah, they slip from our minds. Qala Abu Bakr, he said, فَوَاللَّهِ إِنَّا لَنَلْقَى مِثْلَ هَذَا We experience the same thing. Like I know what you're talking about, I relate to you. So what did they do? They went to the Prophet وسلم, and as they go to him, فَقَالَ رَسُولُ اللَّهِ صلى الله عليه وسلم, when, they said, when he said the same thing, uh, he said to him, وَمَا ذَاكَ What happened? What's happened to you guys? Like what does this mean? And th look at the, the concern of the Sahaba. So he says, يَا رَسُولُ اللَّهِ And he says the same thing. When we're with you, it's like we see paradise hellfire. When we're back home with our wives, our children, our work, our business, in other words, we don't feel the same way. Our iman decreases. It's not like we're seeing the akhirah anymore. So the Prophet ﷺ gave him advice, and this is the famous advice we always talk about. But he swore by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, وَالَّذِي نَفْسِي بِيَدِهِ He said, if you were to be consistent, in تَدُومُونَ عَلَى مَا تَكُونُونَ If you were to be consistent in that feeling that you have, your iman is really high, مَا تَكُونُونَ عِنْدِي When you're with me, وَفِي الذِّكْرِ And upon remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the Prophet ﷺ said, then the malaika would come down and greet you. The malaika would come down and greet you. Where? In your homes and in your pathways, meaning as you're walking around. وَلَكِنْ يَا حَمْضَلَ However, meaning that's not the case. You're not always going to have that high level of iman. وَلَكِنْ يَا حَمْضَلَ سَاعَ وَسَاعَ And he repeated this three times. سَاعَ وَسَاعَ A time for this and a time for that. A time for this and a time for that. A time for this and a time for that. In other words, the sahaba were concerned here. Amongst them, Abu Bakr radiallahu an, we, we, we can't even imagine the iman of Abu Bakr radiallahu an, the greatest follower of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and they are worried because their iman is not consistently high. So with that very common question, we hear or we feel and we experience, why do I feel like my iman is low or I feel bad that my iman is low? It is a natural thought, a concern for the believer, but there are solutions. But you cannot have the wrong expectation that you will always be in a lecture 24-7, reading Qur'an 24-7, upon dhikr and dua 24-7. You're going to have times in which you have to attend to your family, time in which you have to attend to your job, you have to survive, you have a livelihood. It doesn't mean take that as an excuse to not do ibadah either, because some people take this hadith to the opposite effect or the opposite end of the spectrum and they become very lax. They'll say to those who are practicing properly with balance, oh, you're too hard on yourself, you're doing too much. No, I take care of my family, take care of my job. But I do believe that I don't want to be lax with my iman either. So don't also go to the other extreme. It is, it should be mentioned theologically. Of course, generally speaking amongst the Shia, uh, the Khawarij, the Mu'tazila, there are many other uh, groups as well. They do not agree that iman increases and decreases. And even among some of the scholars of Ahlul Sunnah, uh, amongst some, many scholars, not all, uh, who uh, are amongst the Ash'ari creed, they do not believe that iman rises and falls either. But it just depends on the scholar that someone is uh, following. But again, the majority of the early Salaf, the early generations, this is what they believe and it is the safest thing to follow this. Why? Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us in Surah Al-Anfal, uh, in a very powerful reminder, uh, you have actually multiple examples. We can give maybe uh, 10 evidences from the Quran and Sunnah. But on, uh, among some Surah Al-Anfal in the second ayah, إِنَّمَا الْمُؤْمِنُونَ الَّذِينَ إِذَا ذُكِرَ اللَّهُ وَجِّنَتْ قُلُبُهُمْ The believers, those who have Iman, are those who when Allah is mentioned, their hearts are moved. Their hearts are moved. وَإِذَا تُلِيَتْ عَلَيْهِمْ آيَاتُهُ زَادَتْهُمْ إِيمَانًا When his verses are recited upon them, it increases them in Iman. 
This is one example. Another example in the Quran. This is a, a second example. The third example. There are many others like this. For them to increase in Iman upon their Iman. In other words, there is an increase in Iman that cannot be ignored. What about the decrease? The decrease was mentioned in the story of Handala. That we don't feel the same way all the time. The second type of decrease is mentioned in a very frightening hadith. The Prophet ﷺ said that the zani, the fornicator, does not fornicate while he has iman. Meaning at that moment, they don't have iman. It doesn't mean they become kafir. They've rejected Islam and they don't believe in Allah. No, nobody said that amongst the scholars. But in that moment, they don't have iman in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Meaning what? Their iman is very low. And the second example, the Prophet ﷺ, he said, I swear that he has no iman. I swear that he has no iman. I swear that he has no iman. The one whose own neighbors are worried about what he will do, meaning of the harm that comes from him. Does that mean this person became a kafir? They've left Islam? No. So the word kafir and kufr in general is a very, very, very serious thing. But these are absolute minimum level. Al-Iman al-Mujmal, the scholars say, is for someone to believe in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, in the messenger, to uh, testify to this and for there to be something in their actions. But there's a higher level and this is where most believers are or ascribe or aspire to be. This is al-Iman al-Wajib, the minimum obligatory level of Iman, is that you do the things that Allah commanded, the five pillars. You stay away from the prohibitions, and they are not that many. The kabair are not that many. If you fell into something that you repent to Allah, these are the people who are guaranteed to be saved from the hellfire. This is where the guarantee is. As for that first level, the absolute minimum, perhaps Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will punish or He will have mercy. It's up to Him. But it's mentioned in the Quran, there are many threats towards somebody who commits these types of major sins without any tawbah, without any amal. There are uh, reminders in the sunnah that the one who does not pray has no guarantee that they'll be saved in the next life. So they may say, I'm a mu'min, I believe in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but they don't practice the overwhelming majority of Islam. You leave their judgment to Allah, but you see this is, you're putting yourself in, in the most dangerous uh, position possible. As for the minimum, it is to do the bare minimum of Islam. This includes the five prayers. There are many scholars, of course, as you know, Many scholars who said what distinguishes the, the Muslim from the kafir is salah. Tarkus salah is mentioned in the hadith. This is why some scholars said if you intend to leave the prayer and you don't believe that it is obligatory, this is a type of kufr because you rejected the Quran and the sunnah. But if somebody left the salah according to the majority, not all, somebody left the salah, but they know it's a sin, they know they've committed a major sin, they know it's haram to do that, they know there's potential punishment, they know there's potential hellfire, all of that. They know the risks that they're taking playing with that fire. This person is still a believer, but this person is far from Allah in that moment, meaning there's no iman in that moment. So the minimum level, according to many scholars, is for you to pray your five prayers. This is why when people talk about Muslims who are extremists, like who are these conservative Muslims, you ask like non-Muslims, experts on Islam, they say, oh, not the ones who pray five prayers. No, no, the moderate ones, they pray three prayers or two prayers. What are you talking about? Who told you that? Like pillars of Islam, we teach our children. And we know the five pillars of Islam is the absolute basics. So there are different rulings on the one who leaves Salah, but uh, regardless of the ruling, regardless of the opinion that someone follows from the different madahib, what's frightening is that in the Qur'an, Salah is constantly linked to the people of Jannah, the believers. And abandoning Salah is constantly linked to the people of the Hellfire, with Kibir and other things as well. مَا سَلَكَكُمْ فِي سَقَرْ What caused you to be in the Hellfire? The people of Jannah say to the people of the Hellfire, قَالُوا لَمْ نَكُمْ مِنَ الْمُصَلِينَ We were not amongst those who prayed and those who fed the poor. But it goes all the way to the end of that passage and say they don't believe in the afterlife as well. So it's not just salah, but salah is something that distinguishes the Muslim from the kafir. Salah is something that cannot be avoided, something that cannot be ignored. So the majority of scholars say again, the one who leaves salah, but they know it's mandatory. This person has committed one of the most major, severe sins in Islam. And there's a threat that is attached to it, but they are still believers. Otherwise, there are a lot of complications that arise when people uh, reject this. Let's summarize in the last seven minutes uh, the practical things. We need the practical things. This is all kind of like theory. What weakens Iman and what can we do to strengthen our Iman? As for what weakens Iman, it is first and foremost the major and the minor sins. All types of sinfulness will weaken one's Iman. Someone does not go from being super practicing to suddenly committing zina. Now there was a process in between. For example, they thought about it. For example, they texted someone. For example, they opened the door. Shaitan kept whispering, they kept tricking them. So it took some time before they committed a sin. Iman does not vanish just like that. If you've been building it for years and you are sincere, there's hope that comes with that sincerity. And the believer who slips up is so afraid and they have so much remorse, they go back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So sinfulness cannot be ignored. 
Now, many times people ask, what about the kaba'ir, the sagha'ir, some are major, some are minor. And we'll get into that perhaps in a future uh, lecture, inshallah ta'ala, but the sagha'ir, what's called minor sins, this is one classification. The sagha'ir, if they are piled up, the Prophet ﷺ gave the analogy of a group of people who are traveling and they all collect one firewood each. Sagha'ir, minor sin, do you think just a minor sin? It's not a big deal. But you put them all together and you can now light this massive fire. In other words, a sagha'ir with a certain attitude of arrogance or disobedience towards Allah could become amongst the kabair according to some scholars. That you no longer feel bad. Not the action itself, the attitude, the internal uh, arrogance that may come with it. May Allah protect us all. The second, and by the way, here's what we'll do actually. This is an easier way to remember. What weakens iman, what strengthens iman, compare it side by side because they are all related. Number one, what weakens iman is sinfulness. What strengthens iman is tawbah. What strengthens iman is you're always asking Allah for forgiveness. Astaghfirullah wa And we gave many examples in the previous session, previous lectures. So you ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for forgiveness in many different forms. La ilaha illa anta subhanaka inni kuntu min al From the lecture two weeks ago. So the second point, what weakens iman is a bad environment or bad friends. We know this. You can be righteous and religious. But if you live amongst a group of people for a long period of time and everyone is evil, immorality is all around you. And it starts to affect you slowly, slowly, slowly. It desensitizes you, for example. It could have an impact on you. Everyone is different. Maybe you are not going to be affected. But most human beings are impacted by their close friends, by their environments, the place you spend 40 hours a week, by the schools that they attend and the things that they learn. So regardless of how religious you are at home, you could be affected by things outside of the home. Regardless of how religious you are at home and outside of the home, you could be affected by the things you consume on your devices because you're watching so many of these things. So in other words, you protect your environment, filter, reassess. How does this affect my emotions, my mental state, my spiritual state, my physical state, my financial state? How does it affect me in terms of my akhirah? And the opposite, of course, good friends and good environments. And we have so many reminders. But at the end of the day, the believer, sahib, sahib, the believer like, is affected by their friend. They pull you, they affect you. So believers will be with their friends on the day of judgment. But those who are evil, meaning two types of evil friends, will be fleeing from each other. الْأَخِلَّاءُ يَوْمَئِذٍ بَعْضُهُمْ لِبَعْضٍ عَدُوْ إِلَّا الْمُتَّقِينَ أخلاء is a word, not just for صديق, it's a stronger word, close friends. Khalid is a very close friend. Will be enemies to each other on the Day of Judgment. Except for المتقين, the God conscious. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will give them good news on that day. Choose your environments, your friends, very cautiously. The third is beneficial knowledge. So what corrupts is a lack of knowledge, uh, is uh, dwelling in ignorance. What corrupts is taking in actually doubts and doubtful information and the wrong values, the wrong moral systems, watching things, consuming things that are harmful to your akhirah and to your worldview. And what helps your iman is constantly taking in that which is beneficial. The Prophet ﷺ always made dua, Allahumma yasaluka ilman nafi'a, wa rizqan tayyiba wa amala mutaqabbala. And in the Quran, the only command to ask for more of something, wa qur rabbi zidni ilma. And say, my Lord, increase me in knowledge. So beneficial knowledge. What can we do? Consistency. Consistency, alhamdulillah, we have now, we've had uh, other programs, we have a weekly class every Wednesday as an example. This is an example of learning consistently, but what can we do beyond just one place, one time? What can we do for our children? If they are constantly learning, 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 especially in very crucial years of development, that they are learning that which is beneficial for their akhirah. Number four of harmful things is to consume a naturalistic, secular, atheistic uh, foundation of morality. This comes from society, it comes from public education, it comes from uh, secular universities, it comes from the books that we read of fiction, it comes from movies and TV shows as well that people take in, sometimes without checking twice. Not just, oh, is there something inappropriate for my child? Not just in terms of how gory is this or the language. How does this affect your aqidah? How does this affect your worldview? How does this affect what you think is right and wrong? If someone passes by billboards and advertisements for alcohol every single day, or they see this hundreds of times a day online or through some, I don't know, movie or TV show. Even though you know it's haram and you don't ever intend to do it, the, the feeling that you had the first time you saw it, we're like, A'udhu Billah, may Allah protect us, may Allah guide these people. That feeling starts to change. That's what we mean when we say desensitized. So protect yourself when it comes to the wrong moral systems. And, and of course, the opposite of this is what? Uh, immerse yourself in, in systems that will benefit you with good friends, with environments, with books, with everything that helps you. And finally, the, the thing that weakens Iman that many times we ignore is laziness, is inaction. That you know what you're supposed to do and you're simply not doing it. You're overthinking it. Like, why am I not praying soon? Now you got up after so why am I not praying soon? Stop thinking about it, just pray the two rakahs. You're at home, you think, should I pray two rakahs before? Why are you thinking about it? Pray it. Shaitan wants us 
to be very slow to do acts of worship, things that will boost your iman, and to be very fast to commit sin. And we want to be the opposite, where we are rushing to do acts of worship, and we don't rush ever into sinful, so rather we think twice and we seek uh, protection from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So the opposite of laziness and inaction here. And by the way, laziness, the Prophet made dua against it as well. Allahumma ni'udhu bika min al-hammi wal-hazan wa'udhu bika min al-ajzi wal-kasal. Incapacity and laziness, which has become very common. In fact, many uh, researchers say that uh, it's not just because of like chronic fatigue or because of uh, somebody like doesn't have access. We're talking about somebody who has access to eating healthy, to exercising, to uh, moving about uh, up and about. If you have a job where you're always sitting down, that you're making sure you're, you're doing the best thing you can do for your health. So you're staying busy with good things. Maintaining your health, maintaining your health in terms of your body and mind is an act of worship that will affect your ibadah as well. So taking care of your body in terms of being fit and eating clean, healthy foods is an act of worship. And we have to emphasize this in our communities, especially when many I think we have many uh, doctors here, alhamdulillah. Many people are informing us every other week. There's another study, there's another evidence, there's another proof that the foods that people are eating are causing so much harm to them. And the lazier people get, the less likely they are to even want to uh, do anything of self-discipline, including acts of worship. And so the opposite of this, in al hasanat yudhibna sayyat. Do actions. Do actions. And when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us about Jannah, He tells us, وَفِي ذَلِكَ فَلْيَتَنَافَسِ الْمُتَنَافِسُونَ Compete, let the competitors compete. He tells us, وَسَارِعُ وَسَابِقُ Race, rush to Allah's forgiveness. Rushing here is not going to come with laziness. And finally, to reflect, tafakkur. Reflect on Allah. Reflect frequently. These are five very practical things that we can avoid and five practical things we can implement, inshaAllah ta'ala. But at the end of the day, the stronger your iman, the happier you will be internally in terms of your contentment. The stronger your iman, the more protected you are by Allah. The malaika will surround you. The stronger your iman, the less worried you are about the future uncertainties of this life. The stronger your iman, the less worried you are about the enemies of Islam. The stronger your iman, the more light you will have as a source of benefit for other human beings to revive your family, to revive your ummah. has to come from something internal first and foremost. And that internal iman that is written upon the hearts comes from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And finally, of course, the stronger your iman, the more light you will have in the grave and on the day of judgment. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, to make iman, faith, belief, action beloved to us and fill our hearts with it and to protect us from anything that leads to disbelief or anything that leads to immorality, anything that leads to weak iman. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make us supportive to our families, to our friends, to our communities that when someone is struggling with weak iman, we know how to lift them up, how to advise, how to help. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to guide us and guide others through us and to make us a means of revival in the ummah. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to protect us in this life, in the grave, and on the day of judgment. We'll see you all inshallah ta'ala after Salat al-Isha, of course. We'll see you all inshallah ta'ala for the next uh, session. We are going to continue with some traits of the individual uh, reviving basically the ummah. And then we will move on to the family and then we'll move on to society inshallah ta'ala. So we'll see you then inshallah. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullah. Well, good to see you. How are you? Hello, good to see you as well. You mentioned about uh, Pulsirat, like uh, the Munafiq not have light and all that. 